This is Tiffany Rosier, the host of the Afros and Nice podcast. We use the Anchor podcasting app to create and distribute the show. Creating a podcast on Anchor is effortless. It allows you to record a high-quality podcast and distribute it everywhere, including Google Podcast and Apple Podcast. They distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. No fancy equipment or podcasting experience is necessary, and it's 100% free. As long as you have a story to tell, Anchor is the platform to use. Share your story through audio using the Anchor app for audio, for Android, iPhone, or your desktop. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Welcome back to the Afros and Knives podcast, the interview series featuring Black women working and leading in food and beverage, food media, food science, food justice, and hospitality. I am your host, Tiffany Rozier, and this week's conversation is with Brooklyn Native and the founder and chief curator of Caribbean, Shelley V. Worrell. Caribbean is a thriving cultural organization that stands at the crossroads of art, film, and culture. If you just started to make your gift list or if you're in the thick of your holiday shopping, be sure to add cookbooks to the mix. Cookbooks are the gift that keeps on giving all year long. Uh, Ten Speed Press has released some amazing titles this year. One of the very few saving graces of 2020. Um, Vegetable Kingdom by Bryant Terry, which comes complete with a tool and pantry guide and a dope-ass soundtrack, which is available on Spotify. Uh, then we have NBB's Kitchen by Hawa Hassan. This cookbook goes beyond just incredible recipes. It captures all the love and warmth of a grandmother's love, and it honors the rich culinary contributions of the women living in the eight African countries that touch the Indian an ocean. And finally, there's Jubilee by Tony Tipton Martin, which is, this book is a celebration of the unsung, unsung masters of American cooking and a collection of recipes from nearly two centuries of African-American cooking. Uh, this uh, season of the Afros and Knives podcast is sponsored by 10 Speed Press and is made possible through the generous contributions of the Patreon community. Uh, visit patreon.com backslash Afros and Knives to become a patron of the show. I am also currently in the middle of the Afros and Knives Season 4 Pledge Drive. Thanks to Talenti, Gelato, and Sorbetto and their partnership with Black Food Folks for their generosity in awarding the Afros and Knives podcast a $5,000 grant, which brings me to 50% of the goal. So to make a pledge, you can visit the Afros and Knives website, which is afrosandknives.com, or you can make a donation directly through Venmo or PayPal, or you can go directly to the fundraising site, which is gogetfunding.com and then backslash Afros and Knives. So thank you so much for everyone's generosity and support. I am excited about season four, and I would love to continue the work that we have all started together. I believe Black women, specifically in these industries, need a space to tell their stories, to share their wisdom, and it has been my honor and pleasure to be the guardian and keeper of this audio space, and I would love to continue to do it. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the, the rest of the season get funded, and there's just so much in store for next season, so... Um, if you enjoy listening to this podcast as much as I enjoy making it, you can download, subscribe, and leave a comment. Um, reviews on Apple Podcast make a huge difference, so please be sure to just leave a short review, only a couple of sentences. Let me know how you feel about the show, how you feel about the topics, how you feel about the guest, um, and if it has done anything to add value to your life. Um, I love to hear feedback. Don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, it's a, well, as weekly as I can get it. Um, it's, it's a weekly newsletter called The Journal. It features um, an Afro of the week, which is just an Afro in any form, whether it's illustration or sketch or photography. Um, so it's just a celebration of that particular hairstyle that is a symbol of like power and uh, royalty and, and love. Um, we also, I also show... Um, 
any any promotions from my the, my fellow folks in the community. So if there's something going on, an event coming up, you'll find it in the newsletter as well as just keeping you up to date on a new guest or a new series. So be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you don't miss any information. Um, there is, like I said, tons of stuff coming up in the next season, in the next year. You know, uh, 2020 has been a mix of madness and blessing and so I'm going to take the the blessing part and just run with it Uh, so definitely um, you know stay tuned so let's get into this interview with Shelly and I'll see you guys on the other side my name is Shelly V. Worrell and I'm the founder of Caribbean and Little Caribbean NYC Um, and we are a Um, what I call a cultural venture for um, creativity. Um, And so we partner with artists, uh, makers, um, chefs. So culinary artists are included in in that category, um, as well as brands um, to really um, seek out um, and highlight the best of Caribbean culture. Um, One of the things that I think differentiates our work is that we are a pan-Caribbean um, platform. So we are extremely inclusive. Um, in fact, our team is comprised of um, people who are from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, the French Creole-speaking Caribbean, and the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, so the only gap that we have is really the Dutch-speaking Caribbean. And those of you who are familiar with New York City know that there's not a huge population here um, of people from um, the Dutch um, Antilles or the Dutch Caribbean. Um, And so we started this work um, 10 years ago, um, and we started off as a film festival, very experimental. And I think we started with film because I was working in media and television and film um, specifically. So my last job was at Google where I led um, strategic partnerships um, and I was doing content acquisition for YouTube. Um, So naturally, um, that was my strength and that's where we started. Uh, and we, our first event, I would say, wasn't really that successful. It was uh, the Flappish Film Festival here in Flappish, where I live, also known as Little Caribbean. And we put up a series of classic and contemporary films. Um, I'm sure there was food somewhere um, in that. And um, it was a hot mess. Um, I think our most successful program was a senior program, which was a lot of fun. Um, we ended up dancing with everyone and they were like trying to give us money and we were like, no auntie, no money. Um, at least not yet. And, um, you know, I was sort of miserable and decided, okay, this is really not for me. So I went back to working in the media and then the earthquake in Haiti happened and our now co-founder, and creative director Jean-Luc Stanislas, he made a film on that effort. And I felt it was really important to screen that film here in the community. And um, that was an extremely successful event um, that was held at Brooklyn College, the Whitman Hall. There were over 300 people there. There was also lots of food and support from local restaurants, art, music, there was also a talk, and and so immediately we became multidisciplinary and we just kept building out from there. Um, I know I was I was reading your bio, I was like, okay, so um, she's done pretty much everything. <laughs> and, um, and I was just like, how the, I guess for me, I'm always interested in someone's why, because we end up, you know, we choose, sometimes we choose work, other times work chooses us, and we get started on a path and find like either we are unhappy or unchallenged or unfulfilled or maybe we are all of those things but we find like maybe there's a better use of our talent or we're curious about something so for me like of course looking at your history I mean we've got like Brooklyn Historical Society the Brooklyn Museum the Municipal Art Society the Queens Museum I was like good morning America like Enterprise and uh, Google and the History Channel I was like okay um so to make the pivot and to like to kind of look at your life and, and decide like you know I'm going to do something else 
and take an action, but then like applying a why to it. So is, was there a why behind all the work you had done previous that just translated into the work you're doing now and what you're building now? Or did your why shift um, as you like found yourself in a new space? Yeah, and that's a great question. And it's actually very relevant right now. So the why was because since then I saw a lack of representation. Right. And that's what everyone's talking about right now in the height of Black Lives Matter. But this is something that I saw while I was an undergraduate student studying culture um, with a specific concentration in the Caribbean studies um, and believe it or not, archaeology. Um, And I came up with the concept of Caribbean back then. Um, and then I went on to grad school. So the reason why I mentioned grad school is because I always saw that there was a huge, not only, um, sort of opportunity for Caribbean arts, culture, even food, right? I know that a lot of your audience, um, you know, are more in the culinary field. Um, but my first year in grad school at NYU, I was studying hospitality and tourism management, again, because I had a problem with the way Caribbean culture and all just the overall product was positioned in the world. It's really, you know, um, sun, sand, sea, and, you know, we can also add sex, right? Um, so I saw that, that gap and that need for proper and authentic representation since then. Um, again, I had, I didn't realize that I had signed up for hotel school, um, effectively, um, which was reclaiming a lot of, um, land from communities. And so naturally that was not a good fit for me philosophically. So I, I actually then went on to the second, um, you know, sort of like opportunity or need that I saw, which was in media. So I ended up going to the new school to study media studies. Um, and So the why has also always been about like authenticity and representation. Um, We started off with that why. Um, And then, you know, how can I leverage my strengths? I've been traveling back and forth between New York, um, which is home to the largest, most diverse Caribbean community outside of the Caribbean itself and the Caribbean since I was six months old. So I effectively grew up between New York and the West Indies and you know, just the other day, I was counting the number of islands that I visited, and I've been to over 35. Um, so, you know, I've traveled very, very extensively as well in the region. Um, I participated in a number of carnivals. Of course, I've eaten lots of Caribbean food, not only in New York, but on the islands themselves. So, um, you know, that has always been my why. And how can I contribute from... Um, sort of like a place of expertise, right? And so when I mentioned, you know, Flappish Film, like that was something that I was doing professionally in the media, right? I was procuring and distributing um, TV and film content around the world, right? So why not do that for our community? It's interesting that because of where we are, the space we're all kind of occupying right now with re-educating and reprogramming and deprogramming and um, kind of just unpacking and undo undoing and like shedding a lot of terrible education and terrible references and context and like just shedding a lot of the misinformation and in an effort to rebuild in a way that is respectful and healthy and vibrant that something that can actually like grow and so with specifically with like black people we because we're not a monolith and we have so many different like backgrounds and you know ethnically where we're from and you know depending on where, where the slave ship stopped on what continent and landmass and island and like you know those experiences kind of have, have given us this level of diversity just among black people and specifically to those who mm-hmm. are um whose history comes from the islands and comes from the caribbean what is something if someone's re educating themselves at this point? Because I know a lot of the <laughs> history in the United States that's taught about just about any place is kind of trash. Um, so, 
what, if someone's re-educating themselves, what's the first thing for your for you as you kind of got as you got into this work and you know spent time, spent the last decade, you know, just putting new content out and new material out for audiences? What is something that you would want somebody to start? Like, where would you want someone to start? Like dismantling a lot of the misconceptions about the the people who who occupy those islands and come from those islands. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, for me, I would start with probably travel, right? I mean, the best way to sort of like go and and learn about um, culture and history is by actually, you know, physically going there, right? And and by going there, you immerse yourself into not only the culture, the food, the history. Right. And you get to you get to actually um, meet people in real life and hear their stories. You get to go to the markets, you get to, you know, go to the um, downtown, the capitals, whether it's Kingston, Port-au-Prince, Port of Spain, Havana. Right. You actually get to actually feel, um, you know, the music, the vibes and everything. Um, So I would say travel, though, I understand that that could be quite challenging given where we are right now with the pandemic. So I think other good entry points are music. Um, and, and of course food, um, you know, food is something that has this ability just like music, um, to just sort of like, um, I don't know, like gather people, um, even if you don't understand, um, that, 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 uh, song, could be in a different language, right? And you can still, I mean, there's so many songs that I know and love, um, and I don't speak that language at all, right? Um, so it's just the rhythm. It's just, you know, I feel um, I really connect to it. Um, so via the sound, this, um, the syncopation, that kind of thing. So um, that's one. Food, of course, um, is also something that I think is a really great entry point. And then, of course, literature. So if you're interested in the Caribbean, you know, there are a number of fantastic scholars um, and books, past and present, um, that I think that people can start to um, really understand what took place um, in the Caribbean when sugar was king. and yeah, so that's where I would start. My favorite entry point into just about anything is to find a good book um, or find out who the the authors or the writers are within like a culture or an industry or whatever, what, what have you. Um, and I know when we first kind of started on this, like, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black people are cool situation that we're in right now, there was a lot of lists and, you know, of Black people you should follow and read and Black, you know, and all those other things. And often when I look at lists, even before now, you know, with Black authors, a lot of those, a lot of the names that are missing are of black people from all, from other places, from other countries. So a lot of times you're, you're really concentrated on authors who are, or writers who are from New York or California, handful, every now and again, you have a Southern, a Southern author or writer. And for me, it's always frustrating because again, we kind of almost lean or play into the idea that all black people are the same and have the same story and the same voice. And, you know, for me, like reading new authors challenges, not only your like comprehension skills and gives you new information, but having to read a book in possibly a language that you don't quite understand or, and that could be either a completely foreign language linguistically, or because you don't understand the slang or you don't understand the informal language of something or a cultural reference. And So for me, I have always been on a hunt for books by, you know, Caribbean authors and and writers and, you know, trying to find their work. So for you, because you're in so many spaces and you have your hands in so many things, what writers do what writers do you look to and which authors do you come back to that and that you recommend to people? Yeah. um, So that's funny because I'm sitting like in front of my books right now. Um, So I you know, sort of like my favorite Caribbean authors, uh, I'll name, I'll try to name 10. Um, so there's um, V.S. Naipaul, who I'm actually named after, um, particularly his early works, 
Um, so one of my favorite books um, by him is, uh, oh my gosh, and I'm forgetting the name of it. How can I forget? No worries. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember right now, but I'll, I'll come back to it. We'll, we'll, we'll throw a list up at the end or on the, on the episode page. Don't worry right. That. I'm like, how did I forget the name of my favorite book? Miguel Street. Sorry, it's called Miguel Street. It, it just came back to me. Miguel Street is, it's, it's almost like it's a book, but it is also a collection of, of short stories. And I feel like I know everyone in that book. Like I can, it's just in real life. And there, I remember the first time I read that book and being on the subway, just in tears, in stitches, like totally cracking up. Um, just so well written. Um, so his early works are um, extremely powerful, I think. Um, there's also C.L.R. James, um, Eric Williams. Dandicat is one of my favorite writers of all times, Edward Dandicat. Um, she's Haitian, now living in Miami. And actually, when she moved from Haiti, she moved directly to Flatbush, um, not too far from where I live. Um, so I love Dan the Cat, not because of that, but she's just a beautiful um, writer. Um, Franz Fanon, um, Derek Walcott, um, more contemporary writers, um, I would say um, Elizabeth Acevedo, as well as Nicole Dennis Ben, Marlon James. Um, you know, those are all fantastic um, writers, um, that I'm really, uh, and, and a lot of them is sort of like the writing is between the Caribbean and some diasporic, um, city. Um, so I really like that. Um, because I, of course, me being what we call a Carapolitan, um, you know, that, that those works really resonate with me as well. Um, so those are some of the, the authors, um, that I would say are amongst my favorite and, and really, really good um, starting points to, to Caribbean literature. Perfect. And we will definitely get that list posted up on the, on the website. Cause I definitely need to get onto my Kindle and like download as much as possible. The other thing I would add to that, <laughs> um, in terms of cooking is the Naparima girls cookbook. Um, it is just like a quintessential Caribbean cookbook. Um, the recipes are out of this world, really authentic. Um, I, some, I usually around the holidays, we sell it on our site. Um, but in term, and it has like a real diverse, um, set of Caribbean recipes. So in addition to Afro-Caribbean food, um, or even some like slave food, there's also Indo-Caribbean, there's some Chinese cooking in there, um, some Lebanese cooking. Um, so the Naparima Girls, I would also say, is like a quintessential, like from a culinary standpoint, um, book to have. Oh, perfect. What's, I, I mean, since we're on the subject of food, I mean, for you, what's your, what's kind of your go-to dish? And then what's something you're constantly, you know, I was so people cooking is a, a practice. So is there a dish that, you know, you, you, you go to, to challenge yourself? Um, and then what's your kind of your, what's your comfort food? Yeah, I eat a lot of fish. Um, and I would say that's like my specialty. Um, and a lot of people feel really challenged by making like fresh fish. So I make a lot of like whole stuffed fish. It's my own recipe. Um, I just was on Food 52 making a version of it. Um, and so I would say that's like my go-to and something I've been cooking a lot um, this summer. Um, believe it or not, my challenge dish is pilau, which is like a really basic, you know, like almost like an arroz con pollo or paella. paella. Um, dish, but for some reason, mine is like really, really good, but it's not perfect. It's not like my auntie perfect yet or my mom yet. Mm. Um, but I think it had, and I had a whole like 30 minute conversation with my aunt in Trinidad about it, like about a week ago, because I was trying to understand like why my texture was a little bit off. And she, I think she was able to like help me figure it out. And one is because I'm putting the pumpkin, I'm putting pumpkin in it. And, and that sweats it more than I would like. 
Um, but I like my rice with pumpkin. Um, I like my kalau with pumpkin, just like I like my kalu with pumpkin um, and my um, oil down or breadfruit. So she thinks it's because I'm actually adding the pumpkin and adding it too early. So mm. that's something that I make, I would say really, really well, but it's still not like where I want it to be yet. Not like something I would like. I love those types yeah, of dishes. It's not, it's not like something I'm going to go on TV and cook. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think people will come for me. They'll be like, you know what, Shelly? I think you need to go practice that a little bit more. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? What is, what's right. happening with this pumpkin? What, what's happening? Right. And then I'll have to like defend myself and be like, this is the remix, the Taylor remix. <laughs> like, don't remix it. Just exactly. It. Right? And I just don't want to have that conversation. No. Oh man. Uh, what's your comfort food? Like what's the thing, like if you're missing, missing family or friends or home, or just want to kind of rebalance your soul a little bit, what's the thing you tend to cook or eat? Yeah. I'm a huge lover of a roti and there's a particular place in my neighborhood. I won't name names, but there's a, an Asian woman and she's not Asian Caribbean. She's like Asian, Asian who married into a Trinidadian family and she's always debating me and my friends and my mom, who was born in Trinidad and who makes roti, who makes basupshat, like that some people wrap parata. I mean, and, you know, by default, it's just mean, meant to be eaten, not only with your hands, but separate. And so, like, I roll my eyes. I'm always talking about how roti is being gentrified because she is trying to make it a burrito, you know, or some type of wrap. Right. And it's not, you know, and, and there's parts of me that sometimes I don't want to go back there, but their food is actually good. But like, that just bothers me that you're going to like, tell me how this is eaten. I just, for me, there's just certain things that you don't, don't get creative with them. Like the reason why they are what they are is because it is at its like peak when you eat it that way. And so to like mess around, I just don't understand why everything has to be portable or like a sandwich or a wrap or a burrito at this point. Like, have we forgotten to use utensils in our hands and like, what's really going on? Because people have tried to slap things into a pita pocket. I mean, just, I mean, all manner of meals have been shoved into a sandwich or between two slices of bread. I just, y'all come on, right. leave the classics alone. They, they are the classics for a reason leave the culture alone. Like don't try to remix it. Like, I just, and then don't debate. Don't right. debate. That's the part <laughs> that kills me is that first, like I'm telling you, because I eat all of my roti unwrapped, right? Like not, and there's some people eat it wrapped like a regular dalpuri or roti can be eaten wrapped. Right. And I just personally don't like any of my roti wrapped because, you know, I'm half Indo-Caribbean and it's just the way I grew up eating it. And so and I also just don't like my food, like, mixed together. I like my food separate. And, you know, you just dip in, like, the pumpkin. Then you dip in a little chana or potatoes. Or if you're having goat or chicken or shrimp, whatever. Like, I just like to sort of, like, grab the flavors individually. And then, you know, last, like, maybe some tamarind and pepper sauce. So. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go back to the tamarind and pepper. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean. So the one great thing about, you know, growing up Trinidadian in particular is that we make a lot of sauces like chutneys and different types of sauces. A lot of them are sour and a lot are spicy. So tamarind sauce has like these sweet and sour notes and it's eaten with, you can eat it with roti, you can eat it with aloo pie. You can have it with doubles. And I like also to have mine with roti as well. And I also put it on fish to believe it or not. Like I make this tamarind grilled fish. And then, you know, again, you know, a lot of people from the Caribbean, particularly, I would say all of the Caribbean, we love spicy food. So there's always some kind of pepper sauce. In this case with roti, it's usually like some kind of like, you know, scotch bonnet, even a mustardy pepper or mango pepper or something like that. So, and I just, I like my food extra, extra, extra hot. Um, so I put pepper on everything. I collect pepper sauce. Ooh. I have like at least 12 pepper sauces, a mixture of like homemade sauces and store-bought sauces. I wish I could. And 
you know, when people, I don't like spicy foods. It's not that I don't. I usually once or twice a year, I will go to an Indian restaurant and ruin my entire life and digestive system Mm. so I can eat some food because I physically, like the physical reaction I have to spicy food is not pretty. Like I usually will have a heat rash for two or three days. Oh, okay. I just can't even, my body can't metabolize it. Like for me, but I will, again, will sit in a restaurant crying, sniffling, looking crazy, eyes dilated. And I mean, I had one restaurant I went in with a friend and the server kept coming up to me completely concerned that I was going to implode at the table. <laughs> Look, man, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I don't have to go to work tomorrow. I take the day off for a reason because I won't need the full day to recover and it's okay I have a coating on my stomach and this is what we're going to do so like I did the Nashville when I lived in Nashville we used to do the Nashville hot chicken festival that almost killed me once I didn't care because I was like I can go past the heat and get into the flavor is my thing and I'm like it just tastes good and so yeah I just take the hit it's okay but I just I have to be really strategic about the level of heat and like how I approach it the strangest thing was when I started to eat a lot of Korean food kimchi didn't give me as many challenges. So I don't know why that gochujang pepper is a bit different, but where the spice hits my palate, it's not, I don't, I don't suffer as much, but uh, girl, I wish, I really wish because all of my siblings can eat spicy food. I just, whew, you just, it, maybe you need to try like pickles or like more of the vinegar based, mm, you know, which I feel like it's more like kimchi. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like fermentation. has got a little mm-hmm. bit of Okay, we can go into a deep dive on this spice, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to, to back up and go back to your present work and how, you know, I, for me, when I was working as a designer before I became a chef, a big part of how I would work with a client is to make sure that there was always a thread that ran through the design work that was reflective of who they were as a person or the brand or the spirit of the brand. And that way it just felt more authentic and it felt more like who it felt like them. So when you, you know, saw their stuff in public and maybe saw a logo in public and then met someone from the company or the brand, you could recognize kind of the spirit in it that was it was always reflective and always like was creating a mirror so when i look at people's work the first thing i'm always curious about is where are they what part of their dna is imprinted on their work so when someone's looking at the work you do right now what can they learn about you as a person from engaging with what you do that's a good question what can they learn about me i think it goes back to sort of like our ethos of just being inclusive right and that you know, our work is not singular, just like, you know, you talked about being black is not a monolith. Like we really try to embody the entire Caribbean. Right. And I know that's, that could be hard. A lot of people is like, how do you do that? Like, how can you like in one event or one particular dish embody the entire Caribbean? And the thing is, is that we don't. Right. But like throughout the course of our work, right? We have. So obviously like every film screening, every art exhibition, every culinary event or every product that we have may not have every single piece, or it may only represent one particular island, culture, genre, whatever, or even artists. But like, if you look at the work in aggregate, then you will see that common thread. Mm, That's For me, it's when you finally do kind of, especially when you're engaging in like something new and most people are, you know, at this point, I think once we're done with quarantine and a couple of, and all these other things, and we get back out into the world collectively, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how much of the supporting black businesses, black brands, black events, black work will remain. Because I think Mm -hmm. right now, of course, in isolation, when we're kind of in a vacuum at the moment, it's a lot simpler because you really only have to do it through the internet at this point. Like there's really no kind of like put up or shut up. There's no real, you know, (laughs) accountability there for like, oh, we've planned an event and 500 people are expected. And, you know, there is a physical, like there's physical evidence to the support. So that's not really quite pressing yet for most people. And so as they, you know, I think as we talk about 
supporting black people in their work, in their presence in the world, it's important to like remember that just like every other like brand engagement and product engagement that people have in their lives, that when you engage with like, you know, black business and black communities and black companies and all of those things, you're engaged with black people. And it's a way to get to know us and understand us. And so for me, I'm like, if you're out here and you are talking about how much black lives matter to you or black businesses matter to you, you know, this is the work. It's like, you know, you show up to the things that are, you know, happening in the world to start to get to know who we are and what we do and how we move in the world. I'm already seeing that. I, I feel like that whole effort or, you know, I don't know if I want to say effort or like almost like that's starting to fade into the background, right? But, I mean, and it's only been, what, a few months or so I feel like I'm not seeing a lot of that centered as much as we were for the few weeks during the height of all of the protests, right? So we'll see. We'll yeah. See. That'll be, it'll be interesting to watch if mm-hmm. people still prioritize it. Now for, you know, of course, new work always brings us <laughs> joys and challenges. So what was it when you started, when you made your pivot and kind of got out of doing media the way you were into this particular space, what were the things that surprised you about the work that you just didn't expect? And what were the things that were your biggest challenges? Surprise? I would say... You know, well, we started off as a nonprofit, right? And I thought it would be much easier to have a nonprofit than it was, than it is, I should say, rather. Yeah, like that was really challenging for me. Because again, it was like experimental. I was working like back when I started curbing 10 years ago, people weren't doing side hustles like they are now. Like that wasn't really a thing like as it has become like in the last, let's say, five years, three to five years, where it's like, oh, I work full time, but you know, I have this t-shirt brand over here, or I have this over, you know what I mean? Like some other, like I'm a private chef by night or on weekends and things like that until, so for me, being that I had, you know, a profession, you know, I was a rising executive in media and tech. I, you know, set it up as a nonprofit and, you know, I didn't know if anyone would come be interested. So that was also surprising that people, you know, want and continue to want more from us. You know, people like as of a couple of years ago, they were asking us to, you know, like travel with us. Right. So those things were surprising. That is pretty interesting. People are like, can yeah. you take us places? Like, can you take us places with you? You're like, I don't know you like that. <laughs> right. and that's, and that's how I feel because I'm like, you know, do I want to be a, a tour guide or a travel guide in that way? Like for a whole week or even a few days? I'm not sure. Travel is a very specific thing. The other thing is like a lot of academics and scholars have been reaching out about their research as well. So yeah, I mean, those were surprises. There have been a few classes taught on our work, at least two, one at Cornell and one at Brooklyn College. So those were also pleasant surprises that happened along the way as well. What's been the kind of the number one, well, maybe not number one question, what are the questions that kind of still circulate around your work, what are they, you know, because it's been taught, it's interesting because it's usually in response to a desire for some type of knowledge or to kind of re-educate yourself. So are, are there common questions that keep coming back that you guys keep responding to either in your work or just directly in conversation? I can't think of anything offhand. I mean, I think, you know, the common question sometimes is like how we do things, like how did you create the Caribbean house? Who did it? You know, it's more like, it's always like secret sauce, sauce stuff, you know, like no one's sharing their secret recipe. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> People are great. You're just like, no, no, that's no, let's no. You're not like, seeing them go behind the curtain. And be like, hey, Tabasco, like what's the recipe? Like, you think I just, Italian? <laughs> that's like, I'm just curious. They're like, no, you're not. Just go away. Right. You know? And like, how did you globally distribute your sauce? Like. Those are, I mean, you know, people just ask common black people questions or people of color questions. I'm like, yeah, how about that? How about we talk about something else? (laughs) That is hilarious. Audacious and hilarious. It's true. It's actually the most common question. And like now to the point where everyone's prepared for it. So like we all just kind of like, you know, like everyone on the team is prepared for it because everyone (sighs) on the team has 
gotten the question in one or many, you know, like different ways, whether it's about the Caribbean house, about Little Caribbean, about where our products are made and, you know, how this and how that, like, that is the most common question. Oh, that's, and they, that don't, is... if they don't get the answer for me. They'll go to the next person and then they'll uh... <laughs> come back and tell me. I'm like, could you not? <laughs> They, I'm like, we all work together. What made you think? Right. I'm the founder, guys. I have a good relationship with the team. I'm like, come on, get it together. You know, not to give away any secret sauce, but are there projects on the horizon, things that you've just kind of had your eyes on, maybe not have your hands in just yet, or questions you want to answer yourself within your work? Yeah. Right now we're relaunching our websites. So that should be happening sometime in August both Caribbean.com and littlecaribbean.nyc. So that's been really fun. I've been working on that for like a while, a good several weeks. We're working with an agency and some really great creatives on that. So that's one thing. We're also about to launch a campaign with Lyft to support small businesses here in Flatbush, what we call Little Caribbean NYC. So that's very exciting. As I mentioned, I've been working on sort of like just a casual series on Food 52. So the first episode recently went up. I also wrote the corresponding recipe to support of my aunties. I have three aunts that are professional chefs. So I got some technical support from them. So those are a few of the things that we're working on right now that are, are very exciting. I'm a big fan of Food 52. I love I love so much about their brand works for me. And it's just, it's been a favorite since they started. But um, yeah, I've been on it before. Like I was been like guest on someone else's show. She had a Japanese cooking show and we had like a Caribbean barbecue, like, I don't know, like two or three years ago. And it did extremely well. And I was just like, hey, you know, I love cooking. You know, maybe I need to start sharing some of these recipes and yeah, so that's something I've been working on. And they're fun, too. Good. Good. It's been a minute, and I like to do a little bit of research on the folks that I invite on to the show. But there was this really beautiful article in the New York Times about how you spend your Sundays. And I think this is from 2017. And it kind of focused a bit on like the work you do in your garden. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, being a what I would refer to as a plant mother, you know, I, and I love farming and of course, working as a chef, you know, growing your own food and spending time in like outside with your hands in the dirt has always been like something that calls to me. Yeah. So yeah, so are you still do you still keep your garden? Is it something that's been like, because I was like, well, it's been three years. So who knows what that looks like now? No, so people <laughs> no, I, garden, I definitely still garden. I have this year I'm growing tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes, eggplant, a few different peppers. So pimento peppers, which are like a Caribbean seasoning pepper. They're not spicy, but really tasty. I have sweet peppers, cayenne peppers, habanero peppers, and about at least 25 different herbs. So ranging from cilantro to rue, chamomile, different thymes, oreganos, chives, just a lot of different mints. So pineapple mint, peppermint, spearmint, those are for like drinks. So yeah, I still am a gardener. It's very grounding for me. I have two gardens actually. And then also like cooking, like with stuff that you grow, even if it's just like a snip of thyme or rosemary or something, there's nothing more rewarding than like going to your backyard or your you know, container raised bed, or even if it's a windowsill and like snipping off a few herbs, like that's, I think one of the most rewarding. Yeah, things. this is true. It makes you happy. I know I'd gotten some flowers a few days ago and like sitting there and kind of just trimming them and getting them into a, a vase and mm -hmm. like they just, it's very meditative to be able to do that. And same with cooking, right? So it's, it's yeah. like, okay, I'm cooking this, like, what fresh herb, like last night I made a grilled black sea bass and I made it with tarragon, garlic, and just some lime and some black pepper. So yeah, I was like, okay, well, what herb am I going to use? And it was tarragon, right? And I, I mean, I had it, like I didn't have to use dry tarragon, like it was fresh from my backyard. So nice. That is so, it's always like, yes, I know where it came from and whose hands have been on it. It's always, it's always so nice to think about that because 
gardening and like, again, like spending that time in those activities gives you time to like, just think and like be alone with your own thoughts. And currently with us, with a lot of us having to be indoors or having to spend a lot more time pausing and like self-reflecting or hopefully people are, do you find yourself doing any kind of interpersonal work that is new or anything that you have had found some time to like spend working on for yourself that's not necessarily related to the business or to what you're doing for other people? So is there any like kind of self-care stuff that you've had some time to spend working on during the last few months? Yeah. I mean, I've been spending more time on my hair. (laughs) <laughs> look okay <laughs> I have and I usually not like a person because I just like comb it out and it's an afro so I've been spending a little bit more time with my hair and also been exercising a lot more than I normally would so you know making sure I'm going on a daily walk I've been hula hooping which has been a lot of fun love this mm-hmm. so <laughs> a lot of people laugh at me but I actually love it and it's I love it like I feel like I'm dancing and I love dancing and I used to be a dancer. So I started dancing when I was three. So yeah, like walking and hula hoop. (laughs) (laughs) I know I've loved the emergence of like black women on skates in the last few. Oh my God. It's bringing me so much joy and so much life. It is true. I don't (laughs) like the black women who hula hoops. Yes, please. I think it's like you and Carla Hall because I know Carla Hall loves the hula hoop and has put herself (laughs) on plenty of Insta stories with the hula hoop. I was like, no, I think as many black women that can like show those moments to the rest of the world of them enjoying something like that, like deeply enjoying it, I think would boost everybody at this point because like, Honestly, the one thing I have, you know, I definitely can agree with is that finding space for joy is definitely an act of resistance at this mm-hmm. point because... And napping, it's just like napping, right? I mean, yeah. I'm a sleeper. I mean, I'm a sleeper. I've always been a proponent of sleep and I have to sleep eight hours. And so if there's like one, like, I mean, four to six weeks where I may even sleep like 10 or 12 to like completely recharge my batteries, but like sleep is so important and underrated. It's true. And I'm, I've never been really great at it. And I finally went and had a sleep study done. And the doctor was like, you're what we call a short sleeper. You need about five hours. And if you get more than that, you probably aren't any good. I'm like, that's so true. But it has to be like five really good hours. It can't be like three raggedy hours and two great hours. Yeah, but everyone is different when it yeah. comes to that, right? Like for me, it's eight and I know that. And I'm, if not, I'm like completely miserable. Just like in the morning, like I drink lemon water, like ritualistically, and then I have two oat milk lattes mm. right after that with a splash of Angostura bitters. I feel like they need to sponsor me because I'm always like, yeah, put bitters in your coffee. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, like before that, before I'm like on my at least cup and a half, I really don't want to talk to anyone. I'm like, can you leave me alone? It's true. It's true. Like 10 a.m. is usually when I will invite conversation. (laughs) It's usually after like some mushroom coffee with a little bit of oat milk and then we're good to go. Mm -hmm. For like, do you have a favorite oat milk? Because it's kind of new to people. Oatly. Oh, okay. Are you doing the full fat? Barista. Oh, okay. I got I to gotta try to burst. I like the full fat, but I definitely am like, I need something with a little bit more heft. So I might have to lean into the burst. The burst is like, it's good because you could like froth it. Yeah. And like, it's really creamy and milky. Like, I like my milk. Like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> like, people like evaporated <laughs> milk and like condensed milk. Like, yeah. It gives me that full cream flavor that I need. Oh, that's brilliant. Do you have a morning routine that you follow? Because I know like there was, you know, last year everybody was all about it. And then all of a sudden it was like, you don't need to have a morning routine. Don't let these people pressure you. (laughs) It's just like, but having some semblance of routine in your day does help. I I told you, I drink, I drink (laughs) lemon water. And then I drink my two oat milk lattes. Okay, so it's like, then I'm ready to go. That's, that's my morning routine. That's, I see that. And I also, I'm like, the morning routine doesn't have to be anything super hefty. Like, I know I saw some people with like 12 steps in their morning no. routine. I'm like, that's too much. Lemon water. And, oh, and sometimes like in about four to five days a week in between my, my latte and lemon water, celery juice or some type of fresh juice. Okay. It's a large celery base. 
Yeah, yeah. I just got all, I just finished a three day juice cleanse and it started with the celery juice in the morning. So I was yeah, like, that's and I actually like celery juice. It tastes, but I love celery. So it tastes good. I, I thought it tasted delicious. And as long as it's not mixed with anything, I'm fine. The minute they yeah. start mixing and adding things, I'm like, this is terrible. Don't do that to the I celery. I don't like it, but I like it. I do. I enjoy I don't it. I strain mine. It's just like I juice it and I drink it. <laughs> um, to shifting a bit back to your work life combo at this point, has there been any like major like setbacks and failures that you've learned from and that you can like, that you essentially disseminate to you now the lessons to other people? Because I know I was reading about how like you have a really solid team and you have a lot of interns. So what are those lessons that you gain from setbacks and failures that you essentially pass on to your team and to the kids that work around you? I think I probably quit my job a little too early, to be honest. Yeah. So I would say that would have been my biggest lesson, but I still have no regrets though. You know? Right. Like, because at the time I, I mean, there were other reasons. It wasn't only Caribbean. I mean, my father was, was very sick at the time. I also didn't like the team that I was on. So the way I describe it is like, if you have the most expensive pair of shoes in the world, let's say they're like Hermes, right? Which is like one of the most ultra luxury brands in the world. And you have like these shoes and they're amazing, but they hurt your feet. Like your feet are killing you. Are you going to still wear them? So that's really existential in terms of the question. But mm. yeah, I mean, so... I kind of describe because people are like, oh, you quit your job at Google and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I was on a really bad team. Mm. You know, and now in hindsight, like the things that I'm seeing and the things I'm learning, like a lot of it was like racism and like gaslighting, you know, and trauma, you know, even though I was the highest functioning person on that team. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, and I look at some people who were my peers then and they stayed in the media and they're like now in C-suite. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But then, you know, when I look at my work, like, you know, I just had a call before this and, you know, there have been like, I'm not bragging, but there have been over like 200 articles written about the work that we've generated, Caribbean, Little Caribbean, Terrapolitan, myself. I mean, and if I were in the media, like that doesn't happen. Right. And maybe I may have a few write ups because, oh, I got a promotion or maybe I got like some great job or I was at a conference. But like all of this is like us self-generating this work, filling this gap and this need, right? listening to our community and sort of just like following that North Star. So, yeah, I have no regrets. I love it. I mean. The one thing I, you know, from probably right around March when a lot of, you know, people started to be out of work and having to pivot and rethink work and like how, where it is on the priority list and, and what their work could look like. The one thing that has kind of come up time and time again in conversation is this idea of making a pivot and being flexible and kind of not, <laughs> I guess, not absorbing things as a failure or letting failure be something that you are in opposed to something that has happened. And then, you know, the fact that being able to have a setback or fail to have a failure happen is really kind of caught up in this idea of white privilege. It's like black people do not get the privilege of like failure or changing our mind or stepping back or like, we, you know, we have to either charge ahead, you know, we, mistakes are not really permitted. It's just like being able to now hold space for ourselves to look at life and reflect and then make a change or make a shift if we have to. And that just is something that I think, you know, I know we have turned a corner when it feels comfortable to talk about, you know, having to make a change, whether it be a forced change or, you know, an opportunity that comes up and that you can go, OK, I can take on that opportunity. And, you know, people aren't going, well, you know, well, what about your income? What about your job? Because it's oh, it's you know, it's also well, without fail, especially as a young black person. The first question to a lot of people is where are you going to go to college? Are you going to have a job? 
you know, for us, it's always about survival or being able to take care of yourself and not so much pursuing work that means something to you or staying in your purpose. And, you know, we just, the, people don't understand like the reach of systemic racism is that long. And, you know, it's, we don't get that opportunity to, like, I think some, I was uh, talking to someone and they were like, you know, we don't get to go to like think tanks and just wake up in the morning and people will just pay us to kind of create solutions to problems. That's not something that we're afforded. We don't get time to just think or to like to your point about napping. We don't get time to rest. And like the idea of rest within the black community is not something that has the messaging around that has never been great. It's always been well, you know, because, of course, it starts with kind of the lazy slave narrative and then it's kind of just keeps going from there. So it, we're never at rest at any point. We're always having to work and, you know, that whole hustle life and just all of those things. I'm hoping we can all kind of to step back and really look at them and decide that they don't hold the value that they did hold. I mean, there was a time for activity and there was a time for rest. And, you know, it's having the privilege of being able to rest, I think, is really where I'm kind of kind of hanging out, like being able to rest, being able to stop and think. And it's just, you know, that's just kind of always been what has been transpired in the last few months is being able to evaluate, you know, black life in the United States and realizing that, oh, because not even rest and failure and all those other things are part of being able to be black in the United States at the very least. It's definitely a, a part of like the white privilege conversation to be able to go, oh man, that didn't work out. Let me try something else. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting point because also, you know, I think about like if I stopped doing curbing right now and all of my work and went to do something else, whatever it is, right? I think that would be okay. Like, I would feel accomplished, right? Or I said I did a lot. You know, of course, there's a lot more we want to do and that we could do and things like that. So, but yeah, I mean, to your point of rest, the other thing, you know, when I talked about, you know, working at a place like Google, it's, I always felt like I was out of breath. Like, I couldn't breathe. Like, I was like, I don't know why I said I couldn't breathe, but that's how I felt. I felt like I was literally like I couldn't breathe. Like there was a foot, like maybe there was a knee on my neck or I was underwater, like I was drowning. And that's just like not a comfortable place to be. And it's just not the way that I wanted to live my life. So, yeah, but I mean, that is sort of like the state of like what you're talking about of like, you know, not having that privilege. And I speak to people who are still there and you know, they kind of say the same thing, then it's still the same, somewhat. You know, the last time I spoke with someone there, she told me, like, there's, like, a whole crew, they're, like, the Underground Railroad to rescue people. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> she told me that. She was like, well, I'm, like, Harriet Tubman. And I was like, what? I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. I was like, first of all, where were you when I needed you to rescue me? And then secondly... <laughs> Wow. Wow. Like, that's how they call their unit. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Cool, cool. Like me and my sister go, cool, 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 cool. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, right, right. All right. Well, you, wow. Wow. Okay, wow. Sometimes you just go, hmm, okay. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm so glad I'm not doing that anymore. Exactly. So, um, so like, if you're like, like, is that the culture that you want to be in? Right. 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 Oh, wow. Wow. Well, hmm. before my brain implodes from that one, <laughs> I'll give you the last few minutes, like give you just two final questions and then love to hear about like how we can support you and, you know, what work you're doing right now and where we, of course, can connect and find you. So question number one is what have been like your top three favorite moments of like the last like year, year and a half, even though this year has been kind of weird. There's been some really like incredible highlights for people. And then the other question is, what does it mean to be unapologetically human to Ooh. you? So I would say top three, believe it or not, is having the flexibility, you know, during the pandemic, we were called upon to do a number of things. Like one was to feed frontline healthcare workers. Like I we were amongst the first to be asked to do that before, like everyone, all the restaurants jumped on and, you know, everyone was like, Oh, I'm feeding, you know, like I'm converting my restaurant into like a kitchen or whatever. 
to serve frontline workers, like we were amongst the first. And so we were able to turn that around within like a week's worth of food within three hours for two hospitals. Right. And similarly, you know, we were asked to get involved with getting iPads donated to a local hospital who just couldn't deal with, you know, Corona. I mean, one of the hospitals who had like a truck outside, you know, I don't, you know, we know what those trucks were for. And they asked one, actually I was speaking to this underground railroad woman, Harriet Tubman at Google, and she was like, Shelly, and she's also from Flapo, she's of the Caribbean descent. And she was like, well, I want to help Brookdale Hospital. And how can I help? I happen to know the chair of the board. And so I asked him and he said, iPads, he said tech. So we were able to raise funds for that. And then a few days later, the city of New York reached out to me and asked me to deliver 40,000 masks to frontline workers, local restaurants. And so we did that over a week. So that was actually the highlight of my last year is really just like hyper serving my community. Similar to like now this whole lift initiative that we're working on to like gift, you know, to actually like, and I wouldn't say gift, but we have $5,000 in vouchers to support neighborhood businesses. And that's really important to me because like, you know, me being able to go outside and like get roti or jerk chicken or a patty is super important or even go to a West Indian market. And so, you know, being able to have people come here to support these businesses economically is supporting the community where I was born and raised and still still reside. So I would say over the last year, that has been the most important work that I've done. Social impact, community impact. Perfect. I love it. And what was the second question? Oh, the other one is, what does it mean to be unapologetically human? I don't know how to answer that question. (laughs) No problem. Sometimes that's it. That is the answer. I don't even know if I understand that question. It's really just kind of looks at or the question for me examines what it means to minus some of the addict social constructs like what is it to show up in the world as a human being what does that now i mean it's to serve others to like serve Mm. me right i mean i guess that's it i mean what's been great is that no one has the same answer and i think part of the answer the answer itself is wrapped up there is that no one person has the same answer is that to show up as being like unapologetic, meaning like, you know, you don't need to seek forgiveness for, you know, taking up space in the world and how you take up space and how you move in the world is not something you have to explain. It's just like, what does that look like? What does that mean? I mean, I think for me, that's how I would answer that right now. But also, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's how I would answer that. That's perfect. I love it. That's good. So but it's yeah. funny because I have a cousin who calls me humanitarian. She's like, you're my humanitarian. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> right? I mean, the word, the, look, the connotation definitely is problematic. Like humanitarian efforts have done just as much as I think is that some. Is good, for sure. But also I think of a humanitarian as someone like Mother Teresa or like Mahatma Gandhi. You know what I mean? Like sort of like you know, beyond life itself. And I don't see myself in that light. So, but I think serving your community and being, which, you know, and community means like a lot of different things for us and for me in particularly. Lately, it's been hyper local because we were not allowed to go anywhere. I have not been to Manhattan since. <laughs> Actually, I've not left Brooklyn. To be honest with you, have I left Brooklyn? I don't think I've left Brooklyn. Wow. wow. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. That is so funny. You're just like, wow. I know. And when I see people like on like Insta stories or YouTube, like, hey, I haven't been like outside of my borough in, <laughs> in five months. And I'm going. That person. And it's funny because, you know, like New Yorkers are like, there are a lot of New Yorkers. I remember when I was younger, I used to think about my aunt who never left. Like, I have a lot of family who don't leave their borough, like Brooklyn. And in their case, it's like, Brooklyn like they don't really go to the city or to Queens or anywhere am I like auntie (laughs) is there there some secret sauce to like living my life this way 
Oh man, that's yeah. That might like I have. I grew up outside of Philadelphia in South Jersey, and you know, oh, I part actually of- lived in South Jersey. I lived in Maine's Landing, and my mom mm-hmm. used to live in Linwood. Where in South Jersey? I grew up in like. Penzalkin and Collingswood. And then my dad lives in Berlin still. And my grandmother. There's a flea market there, right? Berlin. Yeah. Let's see. But yeah, I mean, I've had like my friends were from, of course, like Maple Shade and where else? Where else? What um, did you go to? I went to uh, Penzalkin Vocational. And okay. then the beginning of my 11th grade year is when we, uh, me and my older brother moved to Arizona. So, yeah. And then it was like after high school graduation, I came back and then I went to the Art Institute of Philadelphia for design and advertising. And I lived in Collingswood at that point. So, yeah, I always tell people, I'm like, most people are like South Jersey. I'm like, yes, we have to make the distinction. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, South Jersey is like an extension of Philly, right? I mean, yeah, like when you're, if, especially in the the more urban parts, it's like I want to say even geographically, technically, it's still a a suburb of Philadelphia. And then you, of course, get outside of that and you start to move towards Atlantic City, and then it becomes its own yeah. thing. But yeah, well, we were more, we were kind of in that area, unfortunately. But I mean, not in Atlantic City, but like in that more of that vicinity. Yeah. It's just incredible because like, you know, I grew up going to like apple orchards and there was always a a ton of green around. So when people ask where I'm from and I explain it, they're like, I've never seen that part of New Jersey before. What do you mean it's green? I'm like anything south of like Princeton is green. (laughs) We're called the Garden State for a reason. (laughs) What what exit were you on the Garden State? Let's see. We were... 114, I want to say, because it gets oh, that's you. High. That's a South Jersey. Yeah. That's like Middle Jersey. That's like just, Central Jersey. Yeah. I'm trying to think, because we would, because everything was like a 35 minute drive. I'm trying to remember, oh my God, like what exit was that? Because we were always off of, let's see, it's Route 130 and then like White Horse Pike. And oh, the White Horse <laughs> Pike and the Black Horse Pike. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm like, oh God, what exit is that at this point? There, We still had like, you know, the roundabouts or the circles. Yeah. Um, I think they had gotten rid of all of them except for one by the time I got to high school. And then, but yeah, I wanted to, like, I was supposed to go to like Rowan University at some point. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was just like when people were like, what? I'm like, yeah, South Jersey is its own place. You've probably driven through it on your way to Florida and didn't even realize <laughs> that you were yeah. driving through it. So but true. like, I love Cape May. I love, I like, love I, Cape May. Oh, it's my favorite beach. But and yeah, I love, like, I love that area. Like, that's just, you know, I would be more than happy to like quarantine there for the next five months if I could. But in South here, Jersey? In Cape May specifically. Oh, okay. I was like, what? Yeah, not just regular. Well, I stayed because I was I stayed with my dad for a minute because I was coming. I drove from Arizona to Boston to work at America's Test Kitchen, and then after that was over, I went from Boston and I was like making my way back to Philadelphia, and I ended up in South Jersey for a few weeks just to hang out with him. And so yeah, then I remembered like this is why I don't live here because he lives in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you're talking like llamas and wild turkeys and yeah <laughs> it was like no sir no sir no thank you that's not for me i need a little bit more city than this thank you so much yeah i'm, I'm from brooklyn so me moving to south jersey just, I was, oh yeah it's just it was like a culture shock thing it really is and you just kind of go it's not it's like there's parts of it that's like city adjacent but nothing's ever fully like urbanized (laughs) so you're just like what is happening yeah yeah it's like a sitcom some way but thank you so much for this opportunity yes but before you hang up like let the people know where we can find you where we can support you where we connect with you (laughs) i mean i guess the best way is sort of on social art Oh gosh, we have so many Instagrams. It's, so our main is I am Caribbean. There's Little Caribbean NYC. My personal account is just Shelly Worrell. I keep it very simple. And yeah, so we're on the internet, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, our website. We respond to emails, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm like, <laughs> We respond to emails. Someone, if it's not me, someone on the team. DMs not always, but sometimes. But yeah, it's been perfect. Thank you so much. See, we beat the internet. Not a problem. We did. We will not prosper against 
that is all for this week's episode. Thank you to our guests for spending some time with us. And thank you for listening in and for being a part of the Fly is Click in podcasting. If you love these conversations, be sure to download, subscribe, comment, and share. You can get further connected with the Afros and Knives community by following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to visit our website, afrosandknives.com, and sign up for our newsletter. Afros and Knives does this work only with the financial support of our Patreon community. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com backslash Afros and Knives and pledge your monthly support. We are working on expanding into video as well as offering patron-only content this year, and you don't want to miss out. Until next week, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be at peace. Thank you.